Awesome. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, we're really excited to be here, but I think before we start anything, I just kind of want to orient everyone to the Zoom setting. So if you want to turn on subtitles or captions, I believe there's a caption option at the bottom right. And then changing speaker view is at the top right. And then just throughout the presentation, if you have any questions or anything, you can leave those in the chat and we'll have kind of a moderated casual Q and A at the end. Awesome. Okay. So let me just get set up with the screen. Okay, great. So first of all, good evening and thanks um, for welcoming Chi and myself to tonight's town hall. We're actually really excited to be here and kind of um, give a fairly quick summary of uh, this research report titled Community Power for Anti-Displacement, an Inclusive Future for Chinatown. Okay, so can we go to the slide, the second slide? Yeah, you might have to scroll down. Sorry, it's <laughs> just a it's second. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, awesome. So um, as mentioned, we're a group of planning students from the University of Toronto and late last year, we were given the awesome opportunity to work with Friends of Chinatown. So again, my name is Dina and I'm here presenting with my friend Chi, but our full team included the wonderful Thomas, Sanjita and Nick. So this is just again, an overview of a 40 page report, but we encourage you to explore the full document, which Friends of Chinatown um, has made available across all their social media accounts. Okay, so um, this presentation is just going to include an overview of the history of Chinatown, its current context, and then how this all lends itself to future strategies for protection. And this is just the beginning, and we hope that this kind of um, inspires continued work towards an inclusive vision for the future. So our research uh, explored, you know, realities of dwindling affordable housing, disappearing culturally competent businesses and the loss of other valued elements um, in downtown Chinatown. And all of this was sort of framed in a planning rationale that hopes to help showcase why maybe a community land trust is an extremely timely conversation. So our team conducted 10 interviews and had conversations with community members, local organizers, and even city staff. And so responses about neighborhood change from these interviews sort of prompted us to do a little bit more digging and do a high level development pattern analysis. So we sort of just compiled a set of descriptive criteria to help us identify potential at-risk property types and help better predict, predict some patterns of change. And so the research also included, you know, a policy an analysis where our team reviewed planning frameworks relevant to Chinatown to better understand the current trends and conditions, as well as future opportunities. Um, we also considered some frameworks beyond Toronto's system just to see what other um, Chinatowns and communities in North America were doing. And she's gonna get into that a little bit more later in the presentation. We also did a quick demographic analysis and scanned local publications in um, a media analysis to sort of supplement our research and get a better sense of sort of the mainstream perceptions and narratives. Okay, so now that we've uh, sort of provided an overview of the research that we conducted, we think it's kind of a good place to, to just pause and quickly introduce a key strategy for community planning, which is a, a community land trust or a CLT which is a nonprofit model that takes land off the property market for long-term use, typically by lower income communities. So whatever is on that land, so if it's you know, housing, gardens, parks, stores, is then governed by the community land trust. So that was just kind of a super brief overview and it 
probably already sounds like a lot, but we just kind of want to let you know here that Chinatown is not alone. So there's, you know, significant evidence on the strength of this as a strategy seen in Chinatowns across North America, like in, in Boston and New York. And then there's also local neighborhoods pursuing similar anti-displacement work here in Toronto. So like your neighbors, friends of Kensington Market, and then you've also got, you know, Parkdale and Neighborhood Land Trust and Black Urbanism Toronto in Little Jamaica. So we just kind of wanted to let you know that, you know, there's a collective of neighborhood groups doing the same type of work. So um, we talked a bit about this report as a way to explore and, and sort of document sentiments of neighborhood change. And I think our interviews were um, really valuable ways to get at that level of information. So some of the key themes that um, we heard was sort of um, an overwhelming recognition of neighborhood change. And this sort of focused in on the need for affordable rental housing, um, specifically in a renter dominated neighborhood like Chinatown, which I believe as of 2016 um, is about 70%. So conversations also uncovered shifts from independent mom and pop businesses um, moving to you know, chains and franchises and things like that. And we also heard a lot about disappearing culturally competent businesses, which I think was mentioned right before we started our presentation. So these are, are places that provide culturally sensitive and sometimes language specific services. And then just overall, we, we kind of heard that even if interviewees or respondents didn't really know what community protection looked like, there was a need for some sort of strategy or plan to, to kind of help protect these valued assets from leaving the community. So we also felt that it was extremely important because it was all kind of new to us that in addition to interview sentiments, adding a bit um, about the history, including the pattern of community organizing against displacement in Chinatown. So the current Chinatown is a relocation and the first Chinatown was the queen, between Queen and Dundas. It was almost entirely displaced by redevelopment and by about the 1960s was expropriated into what is now City Hall and Nathan Phillips Square. And despite significant efforts, including a Save Chinatown Committee, which you can see the, the flyer on the screen in blue, the relocation plan went forward and a majority of these businesses and residents moved to where it's downtown Chinatown is now. Um, here they essentially you know, rebuilt what was once a deep rooted established community almost entirely from scratch. And so this initial uprooting and rebuilding of Chinatown has sort of limited the historically rich built environment that a lot of other Chinatowns may have. So even though there's a vibrant you know, um, history and a concentration of these culturally competent businesses, I think the, what we found was that the lack of a historic building protection like rationale or argument could uh, limit the broader understandings of value sort of from a policy perspective. So our team also conducted like a, a quick demographic analysis of the Kensington Chinatown neighborhood designation. And we found that about 60% of the population is comprised of visible minorities, which is about 10% higher than the, the city as a whole. And additionally, 13% of the neighborhood spoke neither English or French versus the citywide rate of about 5%. Uh, the top three non-English mother tongue and, and home languages were Mandarin, Cantonese, and Vietnamese. And so comments by community members also highlighted that while bearing China in its name and its origins and, you know, having a, a large Chinese population. Chinatown has always kind of been a place for a diverse group of people from over the world. And as the, the population shifts over time, you know, in, in various ways, including age demographics, some moving further north, other immigrant groups moving in, what remains are the values that characterize the neighborhood. So it's still very much a community defined by a racialized working class that relies on and congregates, you know, based on these cultural services that really can't be found anywhere else in the city. So in looking at the development trends, a lot of what we found fits 
you know, the, the broader narrative of changes happening in Toronto. So growth and intensification targets, high development pressure, and then this real lack of affordable rental housing production. So one key finding in our policy scan is that, you know, despite being effectively untouched by any major redevelopment in the last 10 to 15 years, Toronto will, or Chinatown, excuse me, will face strong development pressures in the coming years. And this is due in part to the lack of city policies recognizing Chinatown as a neighborhood. So here, if you look at the map, you can see that the bulk of downtown Toronto has some sort of policy that affects development, whether that's a, a secondary plan or a heritage designation. However, Chinatown, which in this map is outlined in like a red, is one of the few areas in the downtown core that's not fully protected by policy. And there for, I mean, quite frankly, it's there for a place that developers have less restrictions. And um, just as a note to kind of describe the map a bit more, the black outline represents the downtown growth plan policy area with the sort of pink and green overlays showcasing um, areas covered by secondary plans or heritage di districts or current ongoing studies. Okay, so when framing all of this within the context of like true community recognition, we thought that it was also worth noting that Chinatown is split between two wards and therefore local representation. So it fits within the Kensington Chinatown neighborhood designation and it sits in the middle of Ward 10 and Ward 11. Ward 11. So we felt it, this was important to highlight all just to kind of say that organizers should, should be aware of this dynamic when working to advocate and recognize the community within the planning system. And I think this is also why maybe an area study could be valuable as it would it kind of be one of the first documents to uniquely and specifically identify Chinatown, at least as far as, as we could locate as a team. And so in late 2019, Councillors Layton and Cressy requested a formal Chinatown area study, which I believe is expected to, to pick up this year or has already started. Um, but this would all be to review and guide new development in the community. But I think it should be noted that while a, a, an area study is a great step towards more formal recognition for Chinatown, it's sort of limited in its use as a tool to actively prevent displacement, right? So it's, it's fairly like exploratory and, and, it, and it advises and guides as opposed to doing any mandating. So an area study primarily guides the general use, so residential, retail, things like that, and then the built form. So this could include direction on the frontages, the facades, the size of the building, the setbacks, the streetscape, things like that. Like these area studies could also potentially result in heritage preservation and also the development of urban design guidelines. But I think what, what we want to emphasize is that an area study does not directly approach um, anything that would guide demographic or cultural specificity, right? So it like doesn't direct the people or the users of the space, but just, just the use. So something else that came up really organically in almost all of our interviews was a discussion about the 315 Spadina development, which you just heard about. And one thing we know for sure is that Friends of Chinatown's organizing work and you know participation efforts and all of that had a real impact on this project. But we just kind of wanted to highlight it to showcase that this type of development is probably not a one-off or an exception, but potentially pretty typical from here on out. And so I think this quote um, is really great. So in our conversation with Councillor Layton, he brought up a really great point that um, we shouldn't be shocked by developments like these happening. There are developments like this on college and on Spadina, but the reason we haven't seen it to this point is because of the fractured ownership of property in Chinatown. And I think this quote is a really great segue into talking about development trends and what to look for when exploring potential at-risk properties. So as I mentioned, our team was asked to do a preliminary sort of broad high level scan of the development trends in the neighborhood. 
and what the community and the potential land trust should, you know, sort of be looking for or be wary of. And when we talked to people about this, we learned that um, Chinatown has kind of been informally protected from a lot of this redevelopment because the properties on Spadina and in most of the neighborhood are quite narrow and small with each being owned by a different landholder. So there aren't many lots or parcels that are currently large enough to, to like readily fit a mid-rise building. So I think it's safe to say just, just right off the bat when looking at redevelopment patterns, it's pretty typical that the larger lots will go first. And then the next development trend to be aware of is land assembly or the merging of these smaller pieces of land. So what this basically means is that if developers or individuals are buying up consecutive smaller properties, there's a chance that this is being done to, to combine them and create larger pieces of property, since as I mentioned, they're more financially viable for development. And again, since planning in the downtown core, like I mentioned, promotes growth, I think it's also important to be conscious of the high levels of real estate speculation that can come along with this. And again, without any area protections currently, there is a potential for high levels of evictions. And through our interviews, we also heard something really important, which was the unease about the loss of rooming houses, which are multi-tenant homes. So these currently provide deeply affordable housing as an option, particularly for seniors or people who live alone. And I think we found that Chinatown has the highest population of, of rooming houses, both declared and undeclared. And so we feel like this, the loss of this housing type could potentially be destructive to the community. And, and we're kind of flagging all of this to just bring up the need to stay informed on the status of policies like the city's um, current draft policy addressing the loss of affordable dwelling rooms. And then I believe it's Parkdale that also has a rooming house study that's a really good you know, summary outline of, of, of this type of content. So overall, we're, when anticipating any sort of neighborhood change or development trends, I think it's important to stay obviously on top of what's happening in the community, but then also what's happening at the city level, which could impact Chinatown. Hello, it's me, Chi. <laughs> so I'll take over from here. Um, I'll start and give you guys a Sam Stein quote. Um, I'll intro it by saying that, you know, as everything that we've just outlined um, and that Zena has said, the real estate growth that's been planned, and I emphasize planned for downtown, is very intense, but that these real estate markets are not, you know, organically happening out of some sort of invisible market. Um, uh, myth, you know, like the idea of how to protect Chinatown's character uniquely from the, the level of growth that has been mandated from the city for the downtown core um, is very, like, it, has, it was not something that was um, considered when they were putting that plan together. So yes, having the area study is pretty long overdue, um, but in scanning other North American Chinatowns for their planning policies, which you can find links to those other Chinatown planning policies um, in our report, you know, when we're looking at how other Chinatown planning um, studies have really sought to find solutions for rooting cultural use specifically, Toronto's planning system as it stands doesn't have many of those tools that other cities employ at its disposal. These are things like commercial rent control. These are things like tenant right to purchase um, legislation that's not present in our ecosystem. Um, and because this system, which Sam Stein describes as the real estate stage, is a system that's designed to regulate change as property, as opposed to for people and for community, you know, it's managing use, it's managing buildings, but it does not have tools with people first in mind. And so this quote actually is from a conversation with someone else who's also in the room, Mercedes, who recently was in direct conversation at an event um, with the author Sam Stein, the author of Capital City. Um, and this is how he described how gentrification works and which we found very, which we found resonated with a lot of what we heard from friends of Chinatown Toronto. That is that land value fictitiously captures the social and cultural work that communities have put in to make a place what it is. 
And the real estate state says that you can sell this to someone to experience this culture that they did not create. Next slide. So this was echoed by Hanya, our lovely MC and uh, operator of T-Base. So I'll quote Hanya here now. People always wanna capture what makes Chinatown Chinatown. And the last thing they consider, the unquantifiable thing is that it actually isn't the architecture and it's not the buildings. Heritage is the people. And this sentiment, like it can seem very simple and it's, it's also very, very profound, especially when we're thinking about how to go up against these planning systems. Um, Chinatown organizers um, is this like multi-generational network, not just in Toronto, but also amazingly around the world, we're able to connect with other Chinatowns, other cities that have a version of a diasporic cultural community. And when we scanned across, we didn't just look for policies, we looked for reports and documentation of what other organizers that are concerned about affordable housing issues um, brought forth. And we found that A, Toronto is one of the only cities in the world that doesn't have a Chinatown specific planning policy, but B, that heritage designations, while being very common and typically accompanied by urban design guidelines, don't actually end up delivering the level of protection that these communities organize so hard for. You know, neighborhoods can put a lot of resources and time and energy into you know, campaigning for a heritage designation to trying to get UNESCO's attention, et cetera. Um, but ultimately it does a very good job of freezing building facades in time, but it does not actually protect workers and tenants from the forces of gentrification, from rent evictions, from just local indie businesses being priced out and needing to close their doors. Next slide, please. Oh, actually, before I go to the next slide, I didn't even address the two photos. Uh, drop some Fs in the chat for the Bright Pearl restaurant, which was horrifically <laughs> renovated to look like the box <laughs> on the on the right. Um, but case in point that, you know, to Zena's point earlier, Toronto's Chinatown hasn't even been able to play this sort of game, this game that Chinatowns do in like the self exoticization, the self fetishization of Chinese architecture that doesn't actually exist in China. This is a tourism strategy that, you know, local Chinatowns have employed, but it only goes so far. And in Toronto, because our Chinatown had to rebuild itself in the 60s, it, that, that strategy isn't, isn't even as accessible to us. So rather than dump our energy into that, we'll go to the next slide now. So let's talk a bit more about the people. So if, if heritage is the people, let's get more specific about which people. This was a finding that we found particularly incredible during our research. We really didn't expect to find a story like this come through in our interviews. And yeah, it is about the veggie grannies. So much love in the chat. Um, Jasmine uh, is actually one of the people who told us this story amongst many others who also echoed this sentiment. Because the, you know we weren't asking them about street vendors. When we were doing the research interviews, we were just asking generally, you know, why do you think we need to protect Chinatown? What is at stake here? What are we going to potentially lose? And organically, the, the you know the veggie grindings came up again and again. And even though no one in the interviews specifically were able to articulate exactly how this very specific neighborhood phenomenon of elderly Chinese women selling their homemade dumplings and backyard grown vegetables on the corner of Spadina and Dundas were representing Chinatown, clearly their emotional cornerstones um, for a lot of us. So we found that very interesting. Like we found this idea of whether these specific grannies, these street vendors are able to remain as they are in Chinatown and just be there could be a really meaningful litmus test to see who Chinatown is being planned for and who the current community leadership represents. Because the other story that came out was that it somehow was tied to Huron Square. Huron Square used to be, you know, it has really wide sidewalks and it has, it used to be the place where a lot of this informal transaction and market gathering would happen organically. And other community leadership in Chinatown put a lot of effort and resources and time into placemaking and urban designing this space into what is now an Instagram backdrop. And if you've hung out in this area, you probably can also verify that people generally don't hang out here anymore after they've installed those kind of big blocky red, like vaguely Asian looking things. So 
um, this is to make the point that displacement for this neighborhood is not just like this external pressure from the city planning system and from the real estate market. It's also actively being championed from within the Chinatown um, community. And that's very concerning. So it's very timely that Friends of Chinatown might fill this gap um, of community leadership that does have a dedicated focus on inclusion that we didn't see in other present organizations in Chinatown in the same way that would explicitly include seniors, these street vendors, tenants and workers who, you know, I think it's fair to say all equally deserve a right to the future of Chinatown just as we all do in the Zoom room. Next slide, please. So the good news after hearing all that is that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, we thought we would tell you a bit more about what the Boston Chinatown Land Trust shared with us. Um, and this is content that isn't in the report, so it's actually from an update that uh, Friends of Chinatown Toronto was able to get directly from Lydia Lau, um, seasoned organizer with the, China, with the Chinese Progressive Association down there in the States. Um, and these photos show some of their organizing work. So this is a land trust that exists and owns property in Boston. Um, but before they owned property, they were already incorporated as a community organization. Um, residents made up their board and they successfully campaigned um, the, the Boston, uh, the Boston city, I think it was the city uh, rather than any higher uh, legislation around the Airbnb and short-term rental regulations, which was really impacting Boston's Chinatown specifically. Um, and as a result, uh, a lot of investment properties became available for the land trust to purchase after they successfully had that legislated. So they also actively do tenant organizing in Boston's Chinatown, which you can see photographed here. And they help organize um, tenants to consider whether they could build enough power amongst themselves and resources and financing to actually buy out their landlords and remove the buildings they live in from the real estate market. Um, the next slide shows some more photos of their work. And that's a building that they have actually been able to acquire, um, one of the many famous Boston row houses. And this is really fascinating um, in that they really wanted to emphasize because they've had this banner to organize under, they're now invited to various opportunities with the city and also from just other developers and property owners in the area. So their volleyball, for example, is very popular apparently in the Boston Chinatown um, community. And so they were invited by the, by the city to steward a renovation project for a sports, um, a outdoor sports like space um, and, and they were able to guide that work and program it and continue to steward it now. Um, and another very exciting thing for us to hear is that people actually come to them with offers of property. So the children of folks who own property in Boston's Chinatown, one of these row houses, for example, you know, are, will, will come to them and say, hey, we've heard about your work. We think that's very meaningful. We want this property to continue, continue contributing to Chinatown's community and not just help it disappear. And we're wondering whether you would like to put an offer in and let's talk, let's negotiate. Like we would love to sell this, sell this property to you. Um, so that's the, really the power of organizing ourselves as a land trust and what that rallying cry hopefully would be able to attract. Next slide, please. So we'll end with talking a bit about community control and describing the, the vision of what this tool is supposed to fit within because the land trust doesn't operate on its own. It's within this bigger idea of community control that's been going around. And maybe community control won't be the first thing you lead with when you're trying to explain uh, why you're enthusiastic about a land trust in Chinatown, but maybe community power might resonate more. Generally, there's just this idea, and I'll, I'll read this quote out loud on the slide, being thrown tidbits of opportunity here and there to simply be part of the decision is not community control. Otherwise, Friends of Chinatown and other interest groups attending these community meetings, I think they're referring to 315 Spadina here, wouldn't have to fight so hard. So, you know, like Shelley mentioned earlier, Friends of Chinatown can continue to, you know, make a big fuss and continue to show up to specific developments over and over again. And that's a very exhausting short-term strategy. Or we could have a very a long-term vision for what it, what is the world we're trying to move towards in this neighborhood. And so the extra layer here that wasn't present in the previous graphic, you look at the land trust, which is the green banner there, community ownership and land trust. So that's the organizational structure that holds the land that um, all the buildings and gardens are under, are on top of. 
And then the yellow is the paperwork, is the sort of actual legal mechanism in which we'll actually lease that land out for various different community benefits. And in the sky, you have you know, the end result, which is community control. But then underneath all of that, we decided to add another layer because in the best practices documents and the advice that's given from other land trusts who organize, you know, they really emphasize that all of this has to be based in active community organizing and collective care. Otherwise the land trust just sort of becomes like a, our own little club of people who were able to take one piece of property off the market, um, but doesn't have a connection to broader you know, political struggle. The next slide shows a better illustration of that, um, a very sophisticated cartoon that was done by um, some CLTs out in California. So all credits go to Frankie Hyun here and a um, uh, hat tip to Lydia Lowe of the Boston Chinatown Land Trust for showing us this. It's also been translated into Spanish if you would like to see it. Um, uh, happy to make this available as a resource for you to distribute. So I'll just describe a little bit of it. If you can find the Community Land Trust, Kudos to you, because it took me a while to find it for the first time. And this is really just to emphasize that the land trust is just one of many tools, right? This is, an, it's really intended to be an ecosystem of various different things that need to be present for a neighborhood to be equitable, to have democratic control amongst itself, and, and for us to really live in this world we want to ultimately live in together. At the top, very exciting, is tenant opportunity to purchase. Um, which would be first right of refusal for the residents of buildings as opposed to other real estate speculation, which is, which is what they're calling people owned housing, but also worker owned markets and businesses. You know, there's also labor organizing that this has to be done and not just housing on its own. And so this is, I find a very compelling visual of a variety of different housing models that it would live in. And single family homes are still in this graphic. You know, it's not like, <laughs> it's not like they're completely gone. It's just that there's more of a balance. Um, as opposed to things standing on their own. So we'll end um, with a little update. Um, the next slide just shows these, this is a brief summary of all the recommendations we put into the report. And the gist is Friends of Chinatown is so proactive. They're bas they've basically been running everything. All of these recommendations are going forward. They're developing guiding principles coming soon. Currently, you are here right now, thus we are coalition building and developing community relationships. Thank you all for showing up. Um, and we're continuing to do more studies. You know, Corals is doing a thesis on a very related topic to student studentification in Chinatown. You know, watch out for her work in the chat. Fat is also doing his architectural thesis on Chinatown and our struggles here. And we know that lots of other people are generally watching evictions, they're organizing folks in the neighborhood. Many people are publishing different elements, both qualitative and quantitative for what we need in the neighborhood. So just keep your eyes out and we will continue to be a hub for that and help us get there in terms of the next steps. Meanwhile, holding the city planning process accountable and engaging the Chinatown community. And I think, that's a good place to end and find out what everybody's questions are. Would love, would love to hear what piqued your interest, what excited you, and um, please do read the report. <laughs> um, thank you, Chi, and thank you, Zina, for your amazing presentation and for um, all the work that you've done in putting together this report. I think um, we dropped the link in the chat, but we can um, drop it again. Um, so now we have time for a Q&A um, of about uh, 30 minutes or so, maybe 20 minutes. Um, so if you have a question, um, maybe what, there's other people from FOC who are monitoring the chat as well. Um, and you can either ask it in the chat or you can raise your hand and I'll call on you or someone else can um, let me know. Um, or also just feel free to, um, unmute yourself, I guess. Is that kind I of don't chaos? Have a I think it's fine. <laughs> okay. Hanya question. has a question. I don't have a question. I just want to say oh, Hanya doesn't have a question. <laughs> I just want to say that there's 160 people in here. That's I'm so losing my mind. Amazing. I'm truly losing my mind. Like can we can we just give that presentation a round of applause before we move to questions? Because that was phenomenal. <laughs> and yeah. <laughs> Okay, cool. Okay, I have a question. I have a question. I was yeah, being sure. yep. you someone else had a question first. 
It's probably a better question to be asked, but I'll ask this one. Uh, when are you sending the City of Toronto planning office your invoice for all the great work you're doing? Talk, T-based, the U of T students. <laughs> Oh, I mean, we already, we already put up a development sign for them. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Started. You're putting so much great work together. I might as well send them an invoice. Oh, my goodness. We'll cash out when I get to live in afford permanently affordable housing in Chinatown, and I'm 80 years old. You know, if, honestly, if you, if you prepare an invoice and, like, we would, like, support on, like, making a mock invoice, I, I'll be there for you. Because it, it doesn't have to be cash. It could be in kind. <laughs> whatever right <laughs> i want unlimited access to specific counselors time yeah definitely um i see a question from mazdaq uh, vtu do you want to ask your question hi thanks so much for the presentation um good to see everyone this is awesome hi chi um i wanted to ask about the outreach process that you folks kind of took to kind of who you outreach to for for the report and also if um, you gave considerations to you, what your outreach process was so that it facilitated organizing, you know, after what you produced. Yeah, Zina, yeah. go for it. Yeah, let me jump in and then you can add whatever you want to it. So since, I mean, this was a, an academic project, we had a fairly limited scope and, and time frame and things like that. So we sort of took uh, Friends of Chinatown's preliminary list of, of sort of who their existing, I guess we've been calling it like connectors for a coalition. So we determined who those people were and then we kind of cross-referenced it with our own list to try to get a diverse enough batch of interviews that we could conduct within the time frame that we had. And so I think in that sense, we, we wanted to reach out to, you know, local leaders. I think I referenced uh, city staff, community members that really know the community or have been there for a while. And so I think within the, the small group of people that we, we could talk to, I think we covered a lot of bases and had our sort of connectors for coalition as we've been calling them. Okay, so we have a few questions. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go, ahead. Go ahead. Oh, um, so we have a few questions from the chat. Uh, so I'm going to say folks' names. If I'm saying your name correct uh, incorrectly, please feel free to correct me. Uh, but from Rick Wong, have you identified any ideal sites? Yeah, that is that is that is consuming most of our focus. I would say now. Now I'm speaking as Fock, not as the study team. Um, it wasn't part of it wasn't part of our our report. Um, so I would love that to be that was that would be the next phase of work to like actually scope out and acquire property. Shelly, you wanna go for it? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer that a little bit. It's very exploratory at this phase. So the city has loosely identified some potential areas, but they're they're not really um, concrete enough to sort of be actual avenues to pursue. Um, and then just very recently, our friends at Kensington Land Trust offered to help us look into some potential avenues with because they're also working with um, a, a real estate person. So everything is sort of still up in the air for potential sites right now. However, if you know of any, please email us is is one thing um maybe i can also just jump in and say that like given this research this amazing research that chi and Zina and the other students have done um we're not necessarily at a stage yet where we're in terms of working with this idea of a clt or forming one of where we can um say that this is the type of site that we want to acquire because just to speak well, we're going to talk about this at the end of this whole meeting, but one of the next steps that we're taking is we're going to embark on a um, strategic planning process with different um, stakeholders from the community to come up with what are some of the main goals of the CLT. Um, so definitely there's areas that um, have been identified in the report about neighborhood change and just that we all know through lived experience, right? But I think in terms of like whether um, the 
the focus is entirely on housing or does it also include other things like commercial space or does it also include more other things like community space and gardens and stuff that's all still to be determined and I think um, this event is also a way for all of us who are invested in Chinatown and have connections there to start thinking about those things because the CLT is a uh, is a community project, right? And it's owned by the community. And so the way in which we want to make decisions is by input from the community. And it's not about, you know, um, just a number of us kind of like uh, getting on ML, MLS something. Is that what the real estate site is? And like buying stuff up. Um, not that we have the resources anyway, but just to kind of put the focus back again on like this idea of a community visioning. Mm -hmm. All right, a few more questions from the chat. Uh, sorry, did I just interrupt someone? Please go ahead. Go ahead. You, I can go? Yeah. Uh, so, no? yes, please go ahead. Go ahead. All right, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a sole proprietor architect. Sorry, I typed in, wasn't a question, but it was a comment I wanted to bring up. I'm a sole proprietor architect in North York. Um, I want to bring up the idea of building commons. Um, it seems to be the solution for um, these kind of activist, uh, social activist, environmentalists that I follow. Um, uh, you can find some of their books at the new publisher, new society publishers. Um, uh, the one in particular is the David Bollier one. Um, it's called The Insurgent Powers of Commons, uh, Free, Fair and Alive. Um, but, and in, in terms of um, architectural project, it, in my mind, it should be um, a space that is created for um, the public. Namely, the most obvious would be a courtyard and a courtyard, and it could even be above grade, right? And um, it's the notion that um, when you, when you, you know, built a private development, you have to be able to create public space. And that is for the neighborhood and, you know, people at large and city at large, and also um, old world pedestrian spaces, right? That's what we need now. Okay. Um, especially now, right? Outdoor spaces. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, I'm just going to answer a couple of questions I see in the chat. And if we miss your question, just feel free to put it in again. But Tim Maxwell asks, do you know what city owned properties exist in Chinatown other than TCHC and parking lots? And so we do know, and they basically only own parking lots and TCHC. So there are um, no other properties that they own. Um, and we also inquired about the province and the province also doesn't own properties in the Chinatown area beyond I think like government buildings. Um, and the parking lot that um, the city specifically owns in Chinatown is the underground parking lot that's by the Tim Hortons at um, Spadina and Dundas on the south side on the east. Um, east and south side. Um, yeah. And then I think earlier we saw, I saw a question about the Chinatown BIA um, to form a partnership. And maybe Chi and Zina, you can talk about that a bit because you interviewed um, someone from the Chinatown BIA. Thank you. Yeah, Chi, do you want to jump in? Yeah. I'm having trouble on, did I unmute myself? I did unmute myself. Um, so the Huron Square project is the BIA project. Um, and uh, the BIA is very open to talking, um, but they do have a very clear, currently uh, have a clear position that gentrification is a good thing. Um, so I think the bridge is a little long uh, and, and we'll just, we'll take much more time to get to the middle of the bridge. Um, it's because the, the, it's basically very opposing uh, right now. So while not entirely impossible because the BIA is comprised of a group of collective individuals, um, those folks, the, the, the one alignment that I suppose we do have is that they, they do feel some sense of like Chinatown community-ness 
Um, so there is some cultural specificity there that we share. And the other element is that they are also not totally amenable to the idea of people just knocking on doors and doing land assemblies. Um, they're talking to each other about this, like property owners that are part of the BIA. Um, they're aware of this and they're also wary of it. So, you know, whether they're wary of it in the sense of like, how can I get a better deal? Uh, and like make more than everyone else. <laughs> um, that That is, uh, I wanna be the last to hold out to be acquired to be part of a land assembly. I don't wanna be the first to sell in a row. So I'm gonna be talking very closely to the two folks next to me. Um, but that's where it stands, I think, in terms of prospects for a, a partnership. Uh, maybe a related follow-up question from uh, Mazdaq. Uh, but uh, they were asking, did you folks structure the outreach in a particular way that may have facilitated organizing for these coalitions? For example, did you do it in groups of buildings or subsections of the neighborhood? No, it was not that extensive. So we talked to a limited amount of people, which right from the get-go were either involved in some sort of community organization based in Chinatown um, or part of a potential coalition that could come together as a stakeholder um, in this area. So that's definitely future work like business surveys just resident surveys in general i think i think that's to come uh maybe also related to the question of outreach question from Al uh, walter how have you dealt with chinese family clans slash associations who are property owners whose members are aging and whose next generation have lost their linkage with chinatown risk of property being brought uh bought out by big developers yeah, so this is really big. And I, uh, Johnny, are you still here from Value Co-op? Um, okay, I'm not gonna scroll through the pages, but we do have, you know, one thing is if you are a young person with the last name Wong or Chan or any of the big clans and you're in the Zoom room right now and you are, you know, feel yourself aligned to this vision, please do get active in your family association. For those who are outside of the Chinatown community, I've never heard of what the heck a family association is. It literally is like an arbitrary grouping of people that share the same last name, which hypothetically way back when did have like some blood tie element to it. But in addition to family associations, there's also benevolent associations, which are very similar, but instead are based geographically. Like your grandpas all came from the same village um in a specific area of the asian continent so so like these kinds of very very old school associations are one of the types of organizations we write about in the report where you know they are founded on a very very um progress like not not that they would self-describe as pro progressive but they were founded for the the folks who are very marginalized in canada's system for folks who are just coming just fresh you know, off the plane, off the boat, arriving in Chinatown, um, engaged in low income work. The association is probably where you would find housing, someone to just bunk with for the first, you know, two weeks. Um, and this has been going on for centuries in various Chinatowns. So these family associations have a root in like really, really strong community safeguarding and protections for each other's rights and work conditions and fighting together as like laundry associations against the system, fighting for reparations in from the head tax, um, but they have really largely stepped back from those public advocacy roles um, due, to their, yeah, due to their leadership change. So we need young people <laughs> to get active with their family associations and make those connections because what can happen, for example, in Vancouver, um, the Lim Association has a very active relationship with one of the artists that is a worker member and active um, with the Vancouver Artist Labor Union. And the labor union has decided to rent out the ground floor space, space of the Family Association building in Vancouver's Chinatown. And they not only operate out of that space with that connection, but they also are dedicated to using their grant funding and putting labor and time towards digitizing the archives of the Lim Family Association as sort of a reciprocal um, action. And also to make sure that the Lim Family Association can work towards clearing their building debt and be able to root themselves in Chinatown and never be at risk of needing to sell their building and leave Chinatown in that sense. So there's just a lot of potential connections um, through those kinds of associations. And a point we try to make in the report, uh, which I wanna emphasize is that 
you know, like when people try to build land trusts from scratch, from like grand grassroots organizing, a storyline we hear again and again is this idea of needing to build community power or like build community control. And in this case, with a Chinatown, it seems like there is community power. There is community control, but it's controlled by who, like very specifically. And we need to start, you know, rearranging that a little bit and sharing that. Um, so that's what we would like. And yes, a joke, a joke that TVs often makes is that uh, we can all maybe establish some chosen family associations instead. Well, Chinatown has always been, like Toronto Chinatown has a history of being very gay. Like it was just a place, like they were really uh, segregated. So everyone else who was segregated hung out in Chinatown. It's like a solidarity in that. Yeah, I think a point that most people don't realize is that like the word China in Chinatown has very little, little like it has something to do with the idea of being Chinese, but it really like, it's from an era when we were using the word oriental, right? Like, so anything was, anything that like vaguely is Asian is Chinese, is China town. So like, we're talking about Vietnamese diaspora. We're talking about so many other cultures that are subsumed under this banner. Um, and the Chinese dominance is not, is not accurate whatsoever. Suzanne, do you have your hand up? Uh, Suzanne also asked a question in the chat as well. So if you like to bring that up uh, in yeah. addition to your other. Oops. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, like basically I put my hand up because I wasn't sure if the question would be read out. So that's why I did that. But I, I'll, I'll just actually just read my question out. Um, so yeah, thank you, Zina and Chi, for your lovely presentation. I am curious to know what other models of land ownership and stewardship would allow for community organizing and care aside from CLTs. And if that was a question that was um, kind of brought up within the report. Um, and my other question would be, you know, going back to the initial question of land back and decolonization, what vision for relationships with a CLT in Chinatown have with indigenous groups because i mean we can talk about land acknowledgements but then it's also like how do we bring back clts and actually give back to indigenous communities and actually incorporate them within our thinking i'm curious to hear your thoughts and and that of fox folks on this <laughs> yeah um I'm like all about that land trusts are a solution within a property system and property systems are built on stolen land. So the, the danger of tying our fates to a land trust is becoming blind and like sort of suddenly championing the property system. Um, so that, that's why like the guiding values have to have like abolition and like broader calls to like these bigger planning documents that are not recognized as actual planning documents. The Dish with One Spoon Treaty is a legitimate planning document in our world, in the planning system that we work in, in the community planning, in the people's planning. So like that's one way to access that. And if you have that as your planning founding guiding principle, hopefully when the time for abolition comes generations later, or maybe within our generation, fingers crossed, you know, we won't be terrified of it. Like we will see our place in it. That's that's ideally how to do it, how to execute it watching very closely, you know, watching Moms for Housing's land trust very closely in California, watching the Sigore land trust very closely, also based in Oakland, California. Um, you know, other people are talking about how land trusts can be land back, and I think you need to acknowledge that there's many kinds of land trusts. Um, your other question about like what other kinds of like cooperative, well co-ops would be one in terms of like communal cooperative ownership. But the commonality between them is just like housing co-ops sometimes are equity based. So each person would need to actually finance and put that financial stake in equally along with their other residents. And that's not as accessible as like a community organizing strategy, which is why I think so many people default to land trusts because you can both fundraise with grants and also continue to take donations and actually take out a mortgage as a nonprofit organization. Um, and within land trust, like we don't understand them well enough yet. We don't understand that a city initiated land trust or one that has a very large public government element like the Toronto Islands is, fun, is, is, is somehow in nature different than the Parkdale neighborhood land trust, which is rooted in grassroots organizing, et cetera. And all of them lead 
to the ultimate goal of like permanently affordable housing. Um, so that's great, but but there, in terms of values, there there is something different in terms of how they originate. I don't want to say like there's only one way to do a land trust correctly. I don't think that's a good stance to have. Um, but yeah, th those are all definitely good considerations. And I think Friends of Chinatown Toronto is behind the scenes, very actively trying to find um, relationship building opportunities with our land and also with Indigenous community, especially urban indigenous community, which is currently facing a lot of the anti-Asian racism because we get mixed up sometimes in public. So we've been hearing a lot of reports of indigenous, you know, residents being yelled at because someone's decided that they're a chink that day. And it's just like, like they get screamed at just the same as we do. So it's all very upsetting, but we're in it together. Yeah, I think I would also just add, like, speaking from Fox perspective is that um, the question, like the question that you raised is one that we are actively thinking about, and we don't have the answers to, you know, and so I think as we go through the process of like visioning around the CLT, it's really important to have those fundamental questions like built into what the CLT is. And with the goal of like, not wanting to build a CLT that perpetuates forever, but you know, with the goal of not wanting, um, so I have to reframe my sentence, but with the goal of creating a CLT that eventually one day ends, right? Because we, we will no longer live in a property system. So we don't no longer need to have a nonprofit organization. That's a CLT. We don't want to build a nonprofit organization that grows forever and gets bigger and bigger and bigger and gets more and more funds from donors. Like that's not the goal of why we would want to start a community land trust. Um, so I think, yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you so much. It's really nice to hear Amy from you, especially like the fact that you are actually thinking about succession planning in terms of property in that. It's really refreshing to hear. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your questions then. Just wanted to shout you out for that. Lots of shout outs in the chat as well. Such a necessary question. Um, I have two lighter questions, um, probably easier to answer remaining in the chat. Um, so first from Rebecca, how do you find an association? And this was when we were talking about family associations. Yeah, they're a little hard to Google. Um, you might need to try Google Translate into Chinese and then Google that instead. Um, most of them, most of them have mo their main website in English, um, but they usually have an office in Chinatown. If it's upstairs, it's harder to find on Street View. It, it, it is genuinely just a little bit hard to find them. So I don't have any further advice besides Googling them <laughs> and walking around Chinatown. From Diana, um, there's still a few on Dundas too. So Dundas and University. Uh, another question um, from Coral. Any possibilities to retrofit Huron Square with food planters, great south facing light, uh, host events, et cetera, so it doesn't feel so sterile? I think that's a question for uh, either city planning or for, well, I guess we could approach city planning if we wanted to take on here on square as, as this Zoom room of 140 people. Amy, <laughs> Shelly. I mean, I brought it up just because like, I didn't know who actually owned the land if like it was mm. BIA or like the city, but I literally don't see why not. You know, it's- That's true. Cause technically yeah. the BIA approached the city with that idea and the city approved it. And that was it. Uh, so I guess we could approach the city with an idea. <laughs> <laughs> the That'd problem is that BIAs thing. are city funded. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I say something again? Can I jump in and say something again? Hello? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi. Do you have a question? Well, it's just the, um, you know, this, this is the book, Free, Fair, and Life. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you I, for I, showing I'm, the book. I'm just uh, over halfway through it. I haven't, that's been like, uh, I'm not a good reader. So it takes me a long time to uh, read. But uh, he did mention that um, it's the idea of the, the difference between possession and property. The, so there's a chapter, it talks about 
private property and how basically that was you know like a very colonial idea and it was i guess perfected in britain <laughs> and uh, it, it's what's kind of killing everything like you know an environment from you know um the need to own land so i i just want to bring that up like and you know the the the, the younger generations you know like you guys right i mean like to, to keep building private properties uh i mean are, are we still going to be able to reach that goal i mean in future generations uh, with I just want to bring that up and uh, well, is your question whether a community land trust would be considered a private development well yeah are, are people aiming to own the units is that or should it be like yeah a, a, so a, i'll use the term from your book directly so the idea of the commons is that you would do it in collectivity with folks um and so yes we would own the land but together and the governance piece of the nonprofit and how it's structured, it's guiding values would be the part that enables it to not be quite so private. And so I think the issue that's very common that land trusts kind of like have a hard time communicating around is that we're very used to this idea that there's private ownership of things, private assets, private real estate, private property, private businesses, and then there's public businesses and public land, which is owned by the government or the state. But there actually is like a third option that is neither of those things. And that's community ownership and community control. Um, and that's kind of when, you know, within between those, not between those things, just outside of those two things is something that a community can do. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not too familiar with, you know, co-op, um, you know, organization, like housing, how that works, but it would be, I guess, more along those lines, right? People are not looking to, to own their own condo, right? <laughs> like. I, you know, I, unless you're a big developer. You know, um, no, yeah, so I would probably use the graphic we had before where the land trust would own the land the, yeah. to just take it out of circulation. And then who they choose to lease it to might be condos. So in Boston's first property acquisition, they actually did decide to lease them as condos, as 99 year old ground leases, because they wanted that financing to come in so that they could leverage the first property they got, which was very small. And honestly, if they had turned that directly into deeply affordable housing, they would not have been able to buy the next three buildings and they've been able to provide greater housing at more scale. So that's a fair question. It, like it doesn't, the strategy and how we go about this, depending on the governance and the, the democratic decision-making of what this group and what the Chinatown community that in future will be involved in land trust decides to do, could look very different. And maybe it does involve some elements of private living situations in them, but fundamentally the ground is still held by this nonprofit land trust. So that's a bit of the technicality behind it. All right, yeah. Um, you mentioned something about vernacular law. I guess it's um, more- Sorry, I'm just gonna jump in because we just, we only have four minutes yeah, left. Yeah. So we can continue the conversation later, but just to wrap this up on time. Um, so maybe I'll just take the last question from the chat, which is um, from Donnie, which is, do you think the current economic situation is accelerating the process of land assembly? And if so, um, what do you think should, um, should be done to halt or slow this down? Um, and um, maybe I can just speak off the top of my head, which is that um, it, throughout Toronto, we've heard of different real estate investment companies coming in and buying rental buildings. So um, large uh, businesses buying up or large, sorry, I'm repeating myself, but basically investment companies buying up apartment buildings and um, these large conglomerates, you know, getting more profit from rentals and evicting tenants and stuff like that. Um, so I think definitely, yeah. And we, you know, as seen as we're probably all aware of the real estate market in Canada right now is really um, wild. So I think it is definitely accelerating the process of land assembly. I mean, just anecdotally, we've heard about different, um, different uh, land assembly things that are ongoing on Spadina. So 
just rumors in the neighborhood have talked about, have, we've heard about people trying to, um, or actually being successful in terms of buying up buildings and waiting for the right time to sell. Um, and in terms of what could be done to halt or slow this down, I mean, this is one of the main questions that the re report was looking at, right? And so one of the strategies that we have come a around to is this idea of the CLT. Um, other than that, I'm not sure like, you know, within the capitalist system, what can you do from stopping people from buying property? Like, there's not really that much, um, but um, maybe Chi or Zina, you have other thoughts on that question? I think we, you you summed it up pretty well. Sorry, Chi, I'll let you jump in. But yeah, I think I, I feel the same way in that there's really not a lot you can do. Like you, you cannot stop someone from buying a piece of property. You go ahead. Yeah, it's really dependent on that property owner to have cases like like in the honest eds cases where you know there's still two like a single property owner kind of holding out in that way. Um, very Stuart Little in the city kind of kind of vibe. But but if you can manage to get to start talking to these property owners mm -hmm. and to get them to share this information. If you're a tenant living in one of these buildings and you're getting these flyers, you're getting these random calls, you're getting these door knocks, then it would be great to know. It would be great to know and compare and see if it's the same three flyers. Mm -hmm. And if we could just collect those phone numbers and be like, okay, it seems like there's really three main guys who are not doing yeah. this. And just to have them on our yeah. radar. If I can just add to that, so FOCT is in the process of working on some sort of database where we can actually trap track who owns what in the neighborhood with regards to business spaces and res uh, residential buildings eventually. Um, Toronto's Chinatown is kind of unique where a lot of businesses, you know, lease their spaces as opposed to say a city like Edmonton where business owners also own the buildings that they're currently operating out of. And I think Chi, you probably came across this stat when you spoke to the BIA, but the BIA's database of who owns what building is is quite outdated by like 20 years or something like wow. that. And they don't keep these records. Is that accurate? Yeah. Four years, um, even worse. Okay. <laughs> so, so yeah, this is information that we don't have and we plan mm -hmm. to um, go to the, the city's registry to be able to look this up once we can in person. We plan to visit business owners and residents what we can, once we can in person to gather this information. Um, there's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a horrible economic system and this information is kept private to protect the property owners, right? Like it's behind all these paywalls with the province's land registry system where you have to pay like $30 to get this information. Um, so it's, it's intentionally hidden. And if you do see people trying to collect up businesses, please do let us know so that we can investigate as well, since, um, you're all part of the neighborhood. Yeah, thank you for the, the answer to that question. Um, some of the things that are happening in Montreal right now is that, oh, sorry, we're, I'm from Montreal, but uh, some of the things that are happening in Montreal is the, the city has what has formulated a bylaw where they have the right to first refusal so they can actually buy out land when it gets out, uh, when it's actually uh, put on to sale. Um, and specifically in areas that are um, maybe uh, more um, strapped in terms of affordable housing. So it's it's a pretty interesting policy. We'll see how it plays out, but uh, that could be maybe something that could be done in a community land trust organization if it as a regulation to outline an area in Chinatown and say they should have right to first refusal as well. And that, that could be a way to kind of propagate that, um, that type of uh, ownership uh, or that kind of community building. Um, so yeah, maybe that, that could be applied in that uh, in terms of a regulatory framework as well, so that uh, you can kind of pick and choose your lots and pick and choose your battles as well. Thank you, Danny, Donnie, I'm so sorry. Thank you, Donnie, uh, we've got okay. Montreal on the building. I know Karen Cho is in here too. I'm sure we have a few other Montreal people. It is 8.30, I'm sure we could do this forever. Um, yes. And we do have to wrap it up. And I know that this is only the beginning. This is only the start. We want this to be a collective vision. We want to make sure that we're land backing this shit and that we're grounded by collective care and community.
that is really the guiding principles of this work. And we're all in this together. The fact that 160 people showed up shows that obviously we're in this, we're invested, we care about each other. Um, and I think something that we can all do for Toronto folks is uh, there's the city budget vote for the, um, the city budget vote tomorrow. So if you want to hop onto this uh, zap and email your counselor and the mayor to defund the police by 50% tonight, I think that would be really incredible just to boost that. Um, and Lorraine or Diana, if you wanted to touch on like how people can get involved, we're definitely still fleshing out our infrastructure and onboarding methods, um, but we kind of have something set up right now. So if Lorraine or Diana wanted to speak on that right now. I can give it a crack, yeah. Um, so technically we don't have any like eligibility on like who is a friend of Chinatown, but um, as like a team of those most involved, like we do really want to center like racialized folks on our like main team of people who do things. Um, we've been hosting like fairly infrequent volunteer orientations to people who email us like wanting to get involved. So we had one um, specifically around like the call for translation volunteers that we did not that long ago. And we've had, and then I think the last one was a few months before then. But yeah, I, I you know, I think um, we're really keen to like try to grow our capacity to, because there's so much work to be done, but like, we're also really mindful of like, you know, making sure that like we have shared values that we have provide a lot of opportunities like this town hall and like other um, kind of like community building events so that it's like, it's, I don't know, like we, I think we're still also trying to figure out a lot of it and it's like definitely been challenging in a digital space because some of the people we most want to reach like might have you know accessibility issues and like limited internet or translation so these are all things that we're thinking about a lot and like growing Focked, but um, I think the short answer is like email Focked. Um, we've put in the email several times and sign up for the newsletter because that's really where like most opportunities are posted. Yeah, it's definitely a balance of like growing, but not growing too fast and like making sure we're taking our time, you know, but also like onboarding. So we're figuring it out. We're all just trying to figure it out together. So please email us. And that concludes our Community Land Trust Town Hall. Thank you, Zaina and Chiyu for that amazing presentation. Thank you, Focked, working with the best, funny, resourceful, intelligent people. The city should pay us, honestly. And thank you for everyone for coming. These questions were so inspiring and like critical and that's what we need. So thank you everyone for being here. Thank you everyone for always showing up. Follow us on social media, our newsletter, email us. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their week and they think about this, this idea and the, the manifestation of this land trust to keep us going through this dreadful, dreadful winter. I hope everyone has a good dinner, drink some water, eat your vitamin D supplements, eat your mandarin oranges, really solid way to get your vitamin C. <laughs> All right, thank you everyone. Bye-bye, thank you. We love you. Bye, thank you everyone.